My name's Bruce. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome all of you here. Today is a very special Sunday as we have a guest speaker by the name of John Stone Street. I've heard him share this sermon, the first two services, and I've already texted five people and said, please be here at 11 o'clock because it is an amazing message. John Stone Street has, since 2012, been co-host with Eric Metaxas of Breaking Point, the Christian worldview radio program founded by the late Chuck Colson. John is the co-author of three books, Restoring All Things, Same-Sex Marriage, and Making Sense of Your World, a Biblical Worldview. After this service, John will be available out in the commons. He has his books here available for you should you want to purchase one. But right now, would you just join me in giving a big warm welcome to John? Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, brother. Thanks, man. <laughs> Good morning. How we doing? All right, so I have a question. The question I want to wrestle with has to do with how should we as Christians deal with culture? And in particular, there's kind of a, a feeling that I get as I travel around the country and talk to Christians is that there's a feeling, and it's the title of the sermon, Have We Lost the Culture? You know, we sing songs like we just sang. We're songs that talk about Jesus winning our battle, Jesus being our hope. And a lot of times we look at culture, we look at the way things are going, and we see the evil that's out there, we see the craziness and the confusion, and we think, well, wait a minute, how does all of this fit together? This really became kind of an acute realization for me uh, the, uh, last year. Uh, some of you know Sean McDowell. Sean was here, I think, speaking last year during this month. Sean's a good friend of mine. And uh, last year, Sean and I put out a book called Same-Sex Marriage. And uh, people say, why did you write a book on same-sex marriage? And I said, well, you know, easy. We were just looking for a way to make some more friends and thought that that would be the way to go. Um, no, we did it because, you know, this was the issue of our generation. It's the issue of our time. What do we do with marriage? Should we change marriage to include uh, same-sex couples and so on? I know last week you guys wrestled a little bit with this on specifically that issue of same-sex attraction and homosexuality and that sort of stuff with, with Christopher Yuan. Chris is a friend of mine. I know he was fantastic as, as, as always. Uh, we really wanted to look at that marriage issue. And as we went around, we got a whole lot of different uh, responses from a whole lot of different people. But the one that really stood out to me was a pastor who had really been uh, in his state involved in the political process, passing a state marriage amendment to define marriages between a man and a woman. And it worked, but then a judge overturned it. And that's something that had been pretty common at that point. And, and this pastor looked at me and in great despair said this, John, it's over. We've lost. It's over, we've lost. Now, I, I know where he was kind of coming from. He was coming from the perspective of someone who had put his heart and soul into an effort, thought he had won, and you know what? He had done what Christian leaders throughout history had done, which is be a voice in the public square like he thought he should and so on. But, 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 but I tell you, that, that, those words, it's over, we've lost, it made me ask immediately, whoa, 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 wait a minute, what's it that's over and who's we that have lost? Right, And because we have to realize that there's not a single thing that culture can ever do, not a single Supreme Court decision or crazy thing here, there, or anywhere that's ever going to mean that Jesus Christ is going to go back in the grave. So let's, yeah, I mean, let's. So, so, I mean, I guess in one sense, we could make the sermon pretty short and say, have we lost? No, Jesus has won, period, right? End of story. Like, that's, that's really the way that it, that, that it is. But, the, but, but, but we have to figure out how to live in our cultural moment. We have to figure out how to live in a time where there seems to be increasing pressure on Christian belief and on Christian conviction and on being a Christian uh, in, in public. It's okay if you kind of believe Jesus in your own personal little, little world for a lot of people, but when you start kind of taking him into your maybe college, College classroom, or you start trying to, you know, take them into your, your your position as a business owner or something like that. That's where it gets kind of hairy. But here's the good news: we're not the first Christians that have to wrestle with this. If you have your Bibles, go to First Peter. All right. Now I'm going to go ahead and give you an assignment. This is what you need to do to figure out how do we live well in a time of increasing cultural pressure. You need to read First Peter because First Peter was written to a group of people that were experiencing increasing cultural pressure. In fact, you can see it right there in verse one of chapter one, 
Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And he said, why do I care about all these cities? Basically, it means these were Christians that were in Jerusalem and because of the dispersion. What is that? That's Nero's persecution. They had been scattered across the Roman Empire. So their cultural pressure was a lot greater than ours. It was kind of like the cultural pressure that our brothers and sisters and some of the ancient Christian communities on the planet today are experiencing. For being a Christian, they may face persecutions, crucifixions, beheadings, and that sort of stuff. This is what's happening in other parts of the world. This is what's happening here. To those who are elect exiles, look at that language. That might not ring a bell to you, but what Peter is doing there is nothing less than using language from the Old Testament. He's appropriating language that had to do with when the children of Israel were sent into Babylonian exile and saying, this is like that for you guys now. Does that make sense? So this is significant cultural pressure. Now, let me just start here, though, when we talk about how do we move and live and react in culture. One of the things that has gotten in the way, particularly, I think, for American Christians for the last 40, 50 years, is that we've approached culture in bits and pieces. That's something that Francis Schaeffer said, that the problem with Christians, they see the world in bits and pieces. So we've looked at this law, or this song, or that movie, or this artist, or this politician, And we've seen it all kind of as a separate thing, which made us approach culture with the wrong first question. Now, it's a question we got to get to. It's just not the question you want to start with. Here's the question that we've most often approached culture with. Where should I draw the line? Right? And the idea is everything on this side of the line is good and everything on that side of the line is bad. So you can do this, but you can't do that, right? Now, some of us grew up in backgrounds like it's I did, right, where there was a line, right? And everything on this side of the line is good. Everything on that side of the line is bad. So Christian music, good. Rock music, bad. And then somebody came up with Christian rock music. Man, we didn't know what to do. That was confusing. You know what I'm saying? Like, and then like going to movies, bad. But then Billy Graham started to make movies. Now what do you do? And I think what we settled on was if a movie stars Kirk Cameron, it's okay. Okay, right? Now, now listen, we've got to decide, like, what are we going to watch, listen to, involve ourselves in? But that's not the first good question. In fact, I want you to see, as Peter introduces these exiles to what he wants to tell them, he begins by talking about their salvation. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, what we just sang about, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Do you see what just happened there? To talk about their cultural moment, Peter began by saying, wait a minute, don't forget what is the ultimate truth of life in the world. And see, this is something that really gets in the way. The reason we ask, How's, where should I draw the line first, is because we forget that the cultural moment we live in is just that. It's a moment. But it's not the truth about life in the world, not the ultimate truth about life in the world. The ultimate truth about life in the world is what Jesus said, and John the Apostle quoted in his book of Revelation, Behold, Jesus said, I am making all things new. Does that make sense? So what the true story we live out of is not the story of the cultural moment. Now, that's real. I'm not saying it's, you know, fantasy or nothing real. It's real, but the truth about the world is exactly where we need to stand first, that we have to understand the cultural moment in light of the big story of the gospel. And see, what Peter wants us to know and what all the biblical writers wants us to know is that when we say Christianity is true, we're not saying that Christianity is true for us. We're saying that it's just true. It's just plain true with a capital T. If we believed it or didn't believe it, guess what? It would still be true. It's the truth about life in the world. And so we have to make sense of our cultural moment in light of that. And that's why instead of that question, where do I draw the line? I think there's a better first question. And my friends at the Acton Institute, which is a think tank up in Michigan, We have a new study series. Uh, If you do small groups, you'd really like this one. For the life of the world, you can look it up, for the life of the world. But they ask a different question. I love how they put it together. Here it is. What is our salvation for? What is our salvation for? 
I love that. Because you know what? As, as Christians, we usually talk a lot about what our salvation is from. It's, it's, it's from sin, right? We're saved from sin. We're saved from death. We're saved from hell. And if that's all there was, hallelujah, that's pretty cool. And we talk maybe about what we're saved to. We're saved to the glory of Christ. We're saved to the glory of God and to his kingdom. We're saved to the new heavens and new earth. Okay, that's great. But what they want to ask is, wait a minute, what is our salvation for? In other words, while we're here and saved, for what are we responsible? What is the scope of our care and concern about what's happening around us? What is our salvation for? Now, let's answer that question. What is our salvation for? Here's the first thing we have to say. Our salvation is not for escape. Escapism is not a Christian idea. There are escapist religions. If you want a religion that will help you escape from reality, there's a lot of them. They're built around the whole idea where if you're an adherent to this religion, the idea is that you escape. Buddhism, for example, is an escapist religion. The idea is that you can escape into a place in your mind where you remove yourself of desire so that you can remove yourself from suffering, right? Hinduism is an escapist religion as well, where you're in a particular life form now and you try to live the best life you can so that you can have a different life and a different life and a different life until finally you can escape the physical world and join this fabric of oneness that is the spirit of all things. You might say Oprahism is an escapist worldview too. What's Oprahism? It's kind of, that's just a code word for kind of the pop, new agey sort of thing. Like, just, you know, don't focus on the bad stuff. Just focus on the good stuff. Concentrate on all the positive, and you'll get good parking spots and things like that. Now, these are escapist religions. Christianity is not an escapist religion. And there's nowhere here in this book where Peter's trying to tell you, how do you live in exile? There's nothing in here about escape. There's nothing in Paul's writings about escape. There's nothing in John's writing about escape. Jesus spent a whole lot of time talking about how do you live in the world? How do you interact with people? How do you deal with governments? And so on and so on. The reason Christianity is not an escapist religion is two reasons. Number one is you really can't escape culture. You can try, but you just can't. I know this. I am the dad of three little girls. Do you know what that means? That means that everything in my house has one of those flipping Disney princesses on it, right? You could try to escape the princesses. Like the song, Let It Go, has, has been stuck in my head for 18 months, right? But, 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 I mean, culture creeps in. We have a pretty kind of conservative lifestyle, you know? And, and it was so funny. The other, about, I don't know, about a year ago or so, my, my wife put on a praise CD while we, I was cooking breakfast. And the song that was playing was that song, uh, 10,000 Reasons, Bless the Lord, Oh My Soul. You know that song, right? Great song. And my middle daughter, Anna, who's, who was seven at the time, pipes up because she thinks out loud, Hey, Daddy, is that Justin Bieber? We have never had a Justin Bieber song play. I have no idea how she even knew his name. So we spanked her, and then I'm just kidding. We didn't do that. <laughs> I mean, you, you get the, You can escape it. But listen, the deeper truth of Christianity is not just that you can escape culture because we're human. We live in a culture. We live in multiple cultures, really. It's this. We shouldn't. Christianity is not escapist. Why? Because the center of Christianity is the God who became what? Flesh and dwelt among us. In Jesus Christ, I'm going to say this carefully but directly. In Jesus Christ, the God-man, what we have is the perfect personal embodiment of God's long trajectory towards his creation. Jesus Christ embodies God's trajectory toward the world that he had made. God became flesh and dwelt among us. But God coming to the human condition is the norm throughout Scripture. Remember? God comes and walks with Adam and Eve in the garden that he had made. God came down and dealt with Cain. God comes down and walks with Enoch. God comes down and pulls Noah out of the wickedness. God comes down and reveals himself to a polytheist named Abraham and makes of him a great nation. And then comes down in person and reveals himself to, to, to his sons Isaac and, 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 and Jacob. 
Jacob. God comes down and pulls the children of Israel personally out of Egypt, embodying a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. God comes down in the words of the prophets. God comes down and indwells the tabernacle and the temple. God comes down in the person of Jesus Christ. Even Jesus says, it's good that I go away, because if I go away, I'm going to send you what? God, the Holy Spirit, he's going to come down. And the whole trajectory of Scripture, from Genesis to the maps, right, is God comes down, God comes down, God comes down, God comes down, and then the the only time that God stops coming down is in the new heavens and new earth. And you know why he stops coming down? Because what we read in Revelation is that he moves. He makes his dwelling with his people. Do you understand what that means? If the center of our whole religion is this person, Jesus Christ, who embodies God's trajectory towards his creation, then how can we think Christianity is an escapist religion? It's not an escapist religion. And, 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 and again, I think one of the things that makes us want to run or makes us want to hide from the cultural situation around us is that we believe that the cultural moment somehow is more true than the universal truth that Christ has risen from the dead. But let me just say this. Life defeats death, and light defeats darkness. Life defeats death, and light defeats darkness. Let me take you to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Do you know it? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And all things were made through Him. John's giving you the story of everything. All things were made through Him, and nothing was made without Him. And then verse 4, In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not, what? Overtake it. Do we believe this, that the light can overtake the darkness? Do we believe this is what it says? Have you ever been out on your maybe front porch on a really dark night and you flip the light switch on? What happens? The dark doesn't rush in your house. The light rushes out, right? By the way, if you live in a house and the dark rushes in, you need to move immediately. I mean, seriously, like they make movies about your house and you always die. You need to move right? No, the light defeats the darkness. We cannot try to escape the cultural moment. Let me take you to one more passage of Scripture, and I know I'm bouncing around, but I want you to get the big vision of the Scripture. Acts chapter 17. If you can go there really quickly, Acts is Paul. I've talked about Peter. I've talked about John. Let's talk about Paul. Paul finds himself in Acts 17 in Athens. Athens is the cultural epicenter of that whole entire world that Paul lived and walked in. And Athens loved gods. They loved to have a whole bunch of gods. They loved philosophies and ideas. They loved to sit around, it says, and talk about the latest ideas. And so Paul gets an opportunity to stand up on Mars Hill in front of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers, and he had an opportunity to preach the gospel to them. And he starts by talking about God. Now, there's all kinds of lessons to be learned with Paul's winsomeness and Paul's apologetics and the different things that Paul does here, his cultural sensitivities and all kinds of things. But I just want you to look at something that Paul himself said about God in verse, we'll start in verse 20. 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in your temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. In verse 26, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Here's the thing I want you to notice. Having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Did you see that? Did you see that? God determines the time and the place in which we live. It is no accident, Christian, that you find yourself in this time and in this culture. Some of you are international. You've immigrated here. You've migrated here. Maybe you're here for a season. Maybe you're here for a long time. Maybe some of us are headed to other countries around the world. What Paul wants you to understand is is that God actually is the one orchestrating all of this. It It is no accident that you find yourself in this time and in this place instead of another time and another place. One of my favorite stories coming out of World War II and the whole German resistance movement, there was a 
whole bunch of Germans that tried to do something about Hitler. Bonhoeffer, you've heard of, Niemöller, and some others. But there was a group of students, actually, at the University of Munich. And these students decided that they had to do something. So they published a series of tracts or pamphlets anonymously and mailed them to nearby communities and distributed them around the university campus. They did it six different times. And the Gestapo was on the lookout for them. They finally were caught and they were executed. Two, stu- two students led this group. It was a brother and sister, Han Scholl and Sophie Scholl. It's a remarkable story. But Han Scholl was guided by a motto. His kind of life motto went something like this. I am Christian and I am German, therefore I'm responsible for Germany. What would you say? I'm Christian and I'm... American? I'm Christian and I'm female. I'm Christian and I'm a doctor. I'm Christian and I'm a dad. I'm Christian. What would you put in there? What Paul wants you to understand is that God is orchestrating the situations of your life. And what Han Scholl believed, it wasn't an accident that he was a Christian. It wasn't an accident that he was a German. At that time in German history, somehow these two things had something to do with each other. What would you say? I'm Christian and I'm Texan. Therefore, I'm responsible for The universe. You know how Texans are. So you get the idea. What is our responsibility? Listen, escape is not an option. But let me also say this. What is our salvation for? It's not for escape, but it's also not for accommodation. As you read through 1 Peter, you you need to look in every chapter. Peter spends time warning the Christians not to compromise and accommodate to the spirit of the age. He tells them in chapter one, "Be holy as I am holy." He tells them in chapter two, "I urge you as sojourners and exiles, abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul." In a time of cultural pressure, as we're trying to engage the culture around us, it's very tempting to accommodate. And there's two ways that I think we accommodate. Number one is we accommodate on beliefs. I don't know about you. I mean, that's one of the things that Sean and I really wanted to get at in the book on same-sex marriage. It's just that we felt like that in order to be truthful, we couldn't be loving, or in order to be loving, we couldn't be truthful. Do you ever feel that kind of conflict on that particular issue? I certainly felt it, but I believed, you know, that Jesus is the embodiment of truth. Jesus is the embodiment of love. So if they're in conflict, I've got to do more work to figure it out, right? But it's hard because our beliefs get assimilated. Some of us, you know, maybe are sitting here now, we're thinking, well, wait a minute, why is this even such a big deal? You had somebody talk about it last week here at this church, and it seems like Christians are, why is this? And you know what? What's happening is, is that we live in a culture where certain ideas come at us, beliefs come at us, and they don't ever get argued, right? They just get assumed in characters on television shows and good guys and bad guys in movies and so on. It's kind of like this relentless sea breeze. If you go down to South Florida, the trees down there are bent. And it's not because a big hurricane blast came through and bent them. It's because there's this relentless sea breeze that always pushes and pushes and pushes. Do you feel like that from the culture? But time over time, over, after time after time, in 1 Peter, Peter's like, no, 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 no. You need to ground yourself in what's true. You need to ground yourself in what's true. You need to ground yourself in what's true. Don't let the spirit of the age determine what you believe. We have to base our beliefs in what is more true than the cultural moment, and that is what does the Scripture say. But it's also tempting to accommodate in method. And some of us, I know maybe some of you, if you're a part of the younger generation like me, you see how Christians maybe tried to deal with culture in the last generation. It seems like they're so political and they just want to do that. And I understand that frustration. Sometimes we kind of think like, well, wait a minute, this whole problem is political and all the solutions are political. But I'll just tell you what Chuck Colson, my mentor, used to say, listen, Jesus does not come in Air Force One, right? It's not a president from either party that's going to change anything, right? So if we're not supposed to uh, escape from culture and we're not supposed to accommodate to culture, what should our posture to culture be? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to see it really quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. One of my favorite passages of Scripture. In fact, last year, after writing the book on same-sex marriage, I jumped into another book project with my friend on a concept of restoration. Have you ever noticed how many re-words there are in the Bible, especially in the New Testament? How many words that start with the letters R-E? Renew, restore, 
regenerate, reconcile, repent. I mean, that one's a bad one, but we got to, you know, it's in there. You know, all kinds of re's. Here's my favorite reword right here. Ready? Look down at verse uh, 18. All this is from God, talking about salvation, becoming a new creation, so on. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In case you didn't hear me, that is, verse 19, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of what? Reconciliation. You say, what's our, what is our salvation for? Paul just told you. Reconciled ones, like you and me, are to be reconcilers. Those who have experienced redemption are called to be redemptive agents in the world in which we live. And you say, John, you said that there were Christians who have found themselves in really grave cultural times, and there are brilliant stories, story after story after story, of Christians who took their salvation seriously, took their call to minister to their culture seriously, and they actually saw the gospel come to light for people and even for structures, for institutions, for entire nations. Why? Because reconciled ones are called to be reconcilers. Now, I know the question is, what does this look like? How can we be a reconciler? I want to give you four questions. Four questions that will walk you through a gospel-shaped approach to the culture in which you live. These are the four questions that really govern this book that we just wrote called Restoring All Things. Ready? Here's the first question. What is good that I can protect, promote, or preserve? What is good that I can protect, promote, or preserve? Christians throughout history have always been champions of the good. They've always upheld the good, the true, and the beautiful. I'll give you one good that Christians have always held on to. I know some of us have heard, you know, those Christians, they only started caring about abortion in the 1980s because they're Republicans and things like that. That's actually historically not true. From the very earliest document we have of the church fathers, a document called the Didache, which dates back to the second century, there actually is restrictions there and say, thou shalt not commit abortion or procure abortion. Abortion is a, and and the Romans had this practice, but the Romans had another practice, another practice, which is called exposure. In other words, it was a form of infanticide. Children didn't have rights in the early, in this Roman uh, time period. So if a Roman family had a lot of kids, particularly if they had a lot of girls and they didn't want, they only wanted one or two girls and they didn't want all the other girls because they, they thought they would eat too much food. So they would just throw them out in the backyard and let the, let the beast get them or let them die. It was called death by exposure. It was normal in the Roman Empire. But Christians have always, since the very beginning, championed a good. And that good is human dignity, that all human beings are made in the image and in the likeness of God and have inherent eternal value from the moment of conception to the moment of death. That's what Christians have always believed with very few kind of exceptions, which clearly are aberrations. They believed in human dignity. So what the early Christians did when the girls would get thrown into the backyard, they would go pick them up, bring them into the church, or bring them into the Christian families, raise them as their own, and bring them up in the church. Well, you say, well, that's really cool, but that's not the end of the story. You say, well, what's the end of the story? Well, you see, ideas have consequences. And so if you do things, there are consequences. For example, if you take If you keep all the boys in your community but kill all the girls in your community, where are you at 30 years down the road? What do you have? You have a whole lot of boys. But they're not boys. They're now men. And men tend to like women. And they wanted some women, but there were not enough women. So where did they have to go to find women? They had to go to church. Sociologist Rodney Starr. I mean, yeah, this is missionary dating. Sociologist... (laughs) Sociologist Rodney Stark says that that is one of the key factors to explain the explosive growth of the church in the second century is this redemptive activity that just made a difference in the world. What good can we promote and protect? Here's the second question. What's missing that we can add? What's missing that we can contribute? I mean, the classic example of this in in church history is, is Johannes Gutenberg. 
He said, you know what? We, can, we don't have enough. We don't have a way. We're missing a way to get the Bible into people's hands. And Gutenberg was creative like so many of you. Some of you have started businesses. Some of you have a great imagination of where you want to go with your life. Christians have creativity. And when you apply that creativity to the gospel, you get what Gutenberg did. He created the invention that changed the world. The most important invention in all of Western civilization. What was it? The iPad. I'm just kidding. What was it? The printing press, right? So you look at our culture and you say, what's missing? I mean, listen, that's one of the reasons Sean and I wrote the book on same-sex marriage, because we felt what was missing in the whole conversation about same-sex marriage was a rational debate, a calm, reasoned, winsome, unhateful perspective on what is true as a proposal. I was so thrilled when I saw that you guys had Chris Yuan here last because, you know what, Chris, Chris's story and, and, and Rosaria Butterfield's story, that's also two things that are often missing in this whole conversation. We hear all, all we hear is the one story. There's a whole lot of other stories that are missing. That's why it's so important that Christians look at what's missing and find a way to bring it in. By the way, based on that book, here, I mean, we have, uh, we're missing biblical knowledge on this topic. So just, uh, just a few weeks ago, I produced a, a video series, and you can pick it up outside. It's a four-part series on what did Jesus say about marriage. You know, because sometimes you say, oh, Jesus never talked about homosexuality. Jesus never talked about same-sex marriage. Well, that's not exactly true, and I wanted to walk through that in a very rational way that people could use in a small group setting. So that's kind of what I'm doing. What, are you, what can you do? In other words, what is good that we can protect, what's missing that we can contribute and that we can add? Here's the third question. What's evil that we can stop? Christians have always opposed grave evils. The classic example of this is a British parliamentarian named William Wilberforce who thought slavery needed to stop. Slavery is evil in any form, in any kind, at any time. British slavery was particularly evil in certain things. People have written about this. And Wilberforce jumped in to a culture that didn't think it was evil. They didn't think they could stop uh, slavery because that would make sugar cost too much. And Wilberforce had to work in a culture in which, get this, that the culture believed that sugar was more valuable than people. And what did he do? There was a lot of people that believed what he did, and they said, well, we're going to try to help the slaves. So some of them would buy slaves and then set them free, or they would teach them to read or things like that. Wilberforce was like, nope, slavery must stop. And he went after it politically and culturally and business, from a business perspective, all kinds of different ways. He went after it, went after it, went after it. And within 20 years, that slavery had been uh, outlawed in the British Empire. Within 20 additional years, they actually went out, actively abolished it across the British colonies. This is what happened. It must stop. One of the things that that question makes me think of is a former student of mine named Lila Rose. So, some of you may know that name, but if you don't, some of you probably, most of you probably know about the, the videos that came out over the last two weeks exposing some of the real evil things happening behind closed doors at Planned Parenthood. The reason that those videos are even possible is because several years ago, this girl, who at the time was 18 years old, a UCLA student, decided that, 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 that abortion was an evil that had to stop. And she started doing undercover work, which led to more undercover work, which led to this. Now, what's so interesting about this whole conversation is back in 1973, when the Supreme Court gave us the Roe v. Wade decision saying that there was a right to abortion on demand for any reason whatsoever, what we heard from the press, what we heard from the media, what we heard from the cultural voices is the Supreme Court settled the issue. It's over. Anybody who opposes it is on the wrong side of history, we heard. And anyone who opposes it is just old anyway, and they're going to die out, and all the young people want abortion. Let's look at that for a second. There's not an issue more unsettled in America than the issue of abortion right now. And it's not over. Apparently, those who predicted that we were on the wrong side of history didn't really know what the history was going to be. And that's the thing about history. It's a little evasive. But not only that, the pro-life movement hasn't gotten older. The pro-life movement has gotten younger and more creative. And there are more young people. If you do surveys, more young people are opposed to abortion than their parents are. 
You say, John, what's your point? My point is, is this is a, one girl, Lila Rose, and several others are people who are saying, you know what? Abortion must stop in our lifetimes. And they're using their creativity and they're using their connections and they're using these ideas to actually say what Christians have always said. Every human being is made in the image and likeness of God and worthy of dignity and respect. And I tell you what, that is a message that will preach in a culture that is trying to tether human dignity to midair. They're trying to maintain a concept of human dignity in law and in politics and in entertainment and in science and medical and, and, all, and fashion and you name it across the cultural spectrum, spectrum trying to say humans are dignified, but they don't have any reason why. And you know what we say? The idea of human dignity itself comes from Christianity. The atheist Luke Ferry wrote that in his book, A Brief History of Thought. He said Christians were to introduce the idea that humans were equal in dignity, an idea unprecedented at the time, and one to which our world owes its entire democratic inheritance. That's an atheist saying that about Christianity because it's true. So what are the questions? What's good that we can champion? What's missing that we can contribute? Number three, what's evil that we can stop? And number four, and this is my favorite question, because reconciled ones become reconcilers. Here's the fourth one. What's broken that we can restore? What's broken that we can restore? Let me just tell you this. God loves restoration. God loves restoration. I had the privilege of working with a guy named Chuck Colson over the last couple of years of his life. Chuck was involved in prison ministry. There's a population, a group member, a segment of the population that's forgotten, that's scorned, and so on, which is hard. I know we want to be tough on crime, but the fact is, we've been asking the question, how do we get bad people out of our neighborhoods instead of how do we return healthy people back to our neighborhoods? Because most of them are actually going to be released and should be. Otherwise, we're just warehousing criminals. And there's all these problems surrounding this. And so Chuck was big, big on this. But one of Chuck's favorite programs, something maybe some of you have participated in. It's such an example of how restored lives become an act activity of res restoration. Uh, it, it's a program called Angel Tree. Anybody ever participate in Angel Tree at Christmas? Yeah, I see hands all over the place. Angel Tree was the brainstorm of a woman who was once called the modern-day Bonnie of Bonnie and Clyde. She was a troubled 20-something Southern girl who learned how to shoot from her abusive daddy. And so when she met this guy and fell in love with him and found out later that he was a bank robber, she thought it was great, and she helped him rob banks all across the South. And she was apparently pretty good at it. But she got caught, went to the penitentiary. There she met a chaplain, and this tough Southern girl became a Christian, came to Christ. And she started to watch while she was incarcerated how every Christmas the churches would come and bring soaps and toiletries and so on for the ladies there that were incarcerated. And she saw them all hoard as many of them as they could get, and she thought they were just being selfish. But then she watched them further and realized that they were taking them back, and they were taking toilet paper and wrapping them up as gifts and giving their children something for Christmas. And then she thought, well, the kids are going to hate this. What kid wants shampoo for Christmas? But then she saw the kids cry and the kids hug their mamas and say, thank you, mom, I'm so glad. Because why? Because kids just want to know that they're remembered. And so when she got out of prison, she had an idea. She put a Christmas tree up in the middle of the Birmingham, Alabama mall. And another lady said, you know what? You should write the kids' names on little angels and hang them on the tree. And people can take off the angel and buy that kid a gift. And that's where the name Angel Tree came from. She thought she was going to help 100 or so kids that first year. She helped over 500. The next year, 1,800. And then Chuck Colson found out about it and helped her take it national. Now, here's what's brilliant about it. Because Angel Tree is not a church buying a gift for a kid whose parents are incarcerated at Christmas. What Angel Tree is, is a church buying a present on behalf of the incarcerated parent to give to the kid. Does that make sense? Because one of the worst brokennesses that happen in, kind of in a prison situation is that moms and kids and dads and kids get broken. And we know that broken families are great indicators of long-term so on. And so what Angel Tree has become is a reconciling institution, a reconciling program where kids and parents are put back together again. And it's an example of how reconciled ones Become, and it's a great story, how reconciled ones become reconcilers. You say, John, what's this have to do with me? 
as we were putting this book together, we, we looked at 14 or 15 different areas of culture, education and entertainment and the arts and fashion and politics and, and poverty and uh, sex, sex, sexual victims like trafficking victims, abortion, all kinds of different things. And, 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 and we found dozens and dozens and dozens of stories of Christians who are doing faithful, restorative work. And so as we look at the top of culture, and we don't like what we see in D.C., and we don't like what we see in Hollywood, Christian, take hope. God has his people everywhere building culture, not from the top down, but from the middle out. Engaging the world right where they're at. I'll tell you what I felt like after this whole process. There's a story in the Old Testament where Elijah has a big battle with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. And they're, you know, they're fighting about, well, you're going to worship Baal, you're going to worship God, and fire comes down from heaven, and Elijah has a big victory. And then he runs, and then the queen of Israel at the time, this wicked woman named Jezebel, says, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. You remember this story? And so Elijah gets really depressed, and he thinks you know, this victory was fake and, and that he's lost. And so he runs out by, the, by this brook in the wilderness, and he says this, I'm the only one, I'm the only one. And then God shows up, and he goes, you're not the only one. There are thousands of prophets who have not bowed their knee to Baal that you don't even know of. And that's what I remembered when I read this and I saw all these stories and we saw all of this stuff. You know what? Christian, we are part of a movement that Jesus Christ started and it will have no end. And so I quote to close. I quote to close somebody who was a close friend of Chuck Colson's, Richard John Newhouse, and I'll close and I'll pray. Here's what Newhouse reminded us. The Christian has not right to despair because despair is a sin. And the Christian has not reason to despair quite simply because Christ has risen. No matter what happens in the history of the world, Christ has risen. No matter what the Supreme Court does or doesn't do, Christ has risen. No matter what happens with ISIS in the Middle East, Christ has risen. No matter if Miley Cyrus keeps singing, Christ <laughs> has risen. Father in heaven, we love you because you loved us first. Thank you for the knowledge that your kingdom will have no end that our hope is not this wishful thinking, esoteric thing for something to change in our culture, but it's a hope in the reality that will never change, and that is that your son came and died and rose again and now sits on the right hand and is over all. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. The kingdom is not up in the air. It is as secure as has ever been today and yesterday. Thank you, Father. Help us, God, to live in that reality. Make this church, make your people the restorers that you have called us to be. In Christ's name, amen.